it can be truly impressive when a game combines good storytelling with a bone-rattling soundtrack and jaw-dropping graphics. But some of the greatest adventures ever were actually brought to life by this console. Imagine that. The year is 1976. Video game fans are playing Atari's breakout hit in the arcade. Hooked on the gameplay and graphics. But four MIT programmers are addicted to adventure. A Dungeons and Dragons inspired text game with imaginary gameplay and no graphics. It's all in their heads. Being picky uh, programming types, we had a lot of complaints about it. It was a two word parser, you know, kill, dwarf, eat dragon, whatever. Really simple stuff. So we, you know, said, oh, we can do a better job than that. And so we did. January 1977, Lebling and team begin programming an epic game set in the great underground empire with its menacing ruler, Lord Dimwit Flathead. These guys are so buried in code that they forget to name their game. Someone tags it Zork, MIT jargon for an unfinished project. The name sticks, even though it's finished and ready to play in just six months. Zork was written in a language called Muddle allowed very easy writing, very easy debugging, very easy prototyping. So you could sit down and cobble together a prototype of an area of the game in a couple of hours. And then you could have people playing it very quickly. Like today's viral videos shared by friends, university students catch Zork fever across the nation. Thanks to email. Yep email on the ARPANET, ancestor to the internet. They dial up MIT's mainframe day and night to play Zork and embark on a dangerous adventure and a puzzling treasure hunt with a mysterious white house at its core. Playing is simple. Type in any reasonable English sentence. The game understands and follows your command. So if you said, take axe, there would be code associated with the axe that did anything special involving axes. If it's a magic axe, when you take it, it would say, as you pick up the axe, it begins to glow with a sinister blue glow. Zork hooks an MIT professor who urges Leveling and others to form a company and sell it. Enter Infocom. After two years of tweaks, Zork 1 hit stores in 1980 for just about every popular system of the day. Apple, Atari, Commodore, IBM, and it goes gangbusters, becoming the top-selling game software of 1981, 82, 83, and 84. Total sales, $20 million. I think if you look at technologies today, you will see that one of the things that people really hunger for is connection with another intelligent, sympathetic entity. One of the things that made games like Zork popular is you got the feeling, when they worked right, you were talking to somebody who was listening, somebody who was responding in a way that another human would respond to you. Zork and sequels Zork 2, The Wizard of Froboz, and Zork 3, The Dungeon Master, sell a total of 900,000 units before Infocom is bought by Activision in 86. A bunch of text adventures follow, some created by leveling. But to this day, the majority of critics and fans deem Zork the quintessential text title. It's incredibly gratifying that after 30 years, even now, I run into people who were influenced by Zork. Some of them, of course, are people who weren't even born when the games were written. My wife, I think, has put it best. Well, you're semi-famous. 